Okay, today I'm gonna cover something I've been wanting to build for a little while. I watched a bunch of different videos. Uh, these are really popular with the guys in Canada uh, for muskrat trapping and a lot of those guys that they're trapping big lakes, big marshes. Uh, this can be a very effective way of catching muskrats. This is intended primarily for muskrat, but I'm, of course it, it could incidentally catch mink as well. Uh, this is a muskrat float that I built. Now, you have to check your regulations. My state regulations say that I cannot set a trap and have bait visible from the air. Of course, that's intended not to catch birds of prey. Uh, so what I did was, a lot of guys that I've seen, where they met, they'll make a float. Sometimes they'll put lats on each side of the float to try and encourage the ground, or to try and encourage the muskrats from coming up on each end where they're gonna have the trap set on each end. Uh, usually they would use some sort of bait or lure. I would probably use both. I may have a bait visible inside, like a carrot or a parsnip or a slice of apple or something visible inside the little tunnel here. So the, the tunnel here is gonna contain my bait. That means it's not visible from the air. Now, I will probably paint this. Uh, I may also use vegetation from the bank or I may put weed from the water up on the float as well to encourage the muskrats to come up and, and sit on it and feed on it. Uh, from the information that I could gather, floats are a good way to catch large muskrats first. The theory behind that being that when you introduce a flow into an area, muskrats are very territorial, especially in the spring and fall when they are trapped the most. Uh, so large muskrats will try to claim this as new property. They will try to you know, mark it as their territory and try to claim it first. So a lot of times you can catch big rats pretty quickly on this, on this type of system. Now, I, I'm going to probably use one of my 3 8 poles to anchor it that I have for my hags bracket uh, so it doesn't float away. Uh, if I use it in, in a, like a creek situation or a river situation, uh, I would probably use the pole and I may e anchor it too with a weight because our water here, uh, like a, a lot of other places here, they, it can fluctuate really quickly and it can go from you know a very slight flow to a very heavy flow that would rip your traps out of the bank and you know be washing them down the river down the creek very quickly but just destroy your sets and rip your gear away so you don't want that of course but i would more likely use this in still water in a pond type situation so i could anchor it from shore and just let it float out or i can uh you know wade out and then set it in the water close to cover close to a weed bed or wherever i want and i'll i'll use the pole to anchor i may drill a hole in it uh i what i did was it's basically a pressure treated base this is all just made out of junk scrap wood that I had laying around. Some of the wood was made was left over from weasel boxes and from the mink boxes that I made as well that I didn't want to throw out. Lumber now, the price is absolutely ridiculous through the roof. Of course, it was all blamed on COVID, so apparently COVID affects the price of lumber. But this is all made out of scrap. So you can see here on the base of it, I have mounted pool noodles to it. On each side that's going to keep the wood you know floating high it's going to keep it floating high in the water so it's not submerged in water uh, I, i'm making this well ahead of season i will probably paint it and seal it so it's not sucking up water constantly uh, i have a, a pretty limited window for this to be able to use it usually uh, my mink and muskrat season starts in late november I'm gonna say around you know November 15th, November 20th, something like that. It, it's not too long after that that I start to see ice in the water. So I have pretty limited time that I can use a float. Uh, that was a, a big reason why I went with the hags bracket because I can actually use the hags brackets uh, under the ice on my conibear traps. I can use those poles and trap through the ice. So if I, if I have to do that, I can. Uh, that might be something I try more this year. So I have two options that I can go with on this for traps. Of course, I had the little house screwed down to it. This is basically just cedar, and then the bottom part of it is pressure-treated timber. 
You can see here in the front part of it, I have a, a 110 Conor Bear mounted to it on a Conor Bear Keeper. It's not mounted in the box, it's mounted outside the box, you can see. But you can see, you can see all the way through it. There's nothing obstructing it. And you can see on the other end, I have a one and a half Duke. That I have just resting under the conibear clip there. You see I had the conibear clip mounted on it. Take notice too that you see that I have the conibear clip is not screwed flat to it. It's actually raised up. So it's not le it's not flush with the bottom of the, the wood and I'll show you why. On these uh, conibear traps here, these are Duke traps. But you'll see when I hold it up here. You can see it has a bend in the bottom of the trap. Now my Bridger traps are not like that. They're straight. And I believe the Belial traps too. They're straight across. This has a, a, a hook bend in it. So the actual base of the trap sits up higher than where the base sits. Uh, I'm imagining that's to prevent it from freezing down. Uh, it's also to retain the spring. But that means that this doesn't sit flush with the bottom, so you actually have to have the, the keeper just a little bit up off of the base of the timber so that will hold it. Now, you can see in the, in the base here, I've actually driven fence post staples into it. Pretty large ones. I had the box there somewhere. Let me this one right here. See that fits perfectly right in front of it. But yeah, I use fence post staples, which I don't know where I put, but they're here somewhere, but they're pretty, pretty large ones. Oh, there they are, I see them. They're inch and a half. Pretty decent size ones. You see that there against my shirt. So they're not gonna pull out, especially with a muskrat or a mink. There's no way they're pulling that out. If you can see it, I can choose and pick to what, what sort of trap I want on it. Like I said, this side I have the Duke one and a half that I have set up for water. Uh, I did want my water traps this time. You see I have my Hags bracket mount on this. So if I want to, on the, on the platform here, I can use the screw hole in the other side and screw this directly to the side of the platform here. So your intention is that when the muskrat goes into the trap, he walks into the trap, he sets the trap off, and then dives off into the water and the weight of the trap is gonna drown him. Uh, you can see on these, these traps too, I've laminated the jaw. See that? I, sp I basically got 11 gauge wire that I used for making my uh, cable restraint anchors. And what I did was I spot welded it on each side of the jaw. So I effectively doubled the width of my jaw. I can double the width of the jaw. See right there. Uh, I'm going to try that for because these traps too I'm going to intend for catching coon. Now this is going to increase the width of the jaw. It also increases the strength of the jaw. But it's to prevent uh, animals like muskrat. Well with this you want to catch them and drown them quick. You don't want a muskrat fighting in a, a full hole trap like this because he'll wring his foot off and he'll escape. Uh, coon too will have a tendency to chew their feet if their foot goes numb. And they will damage their foot and get out of the trap. And I, I don't want that. I don't, you know, you don't want any of that going on. You want to be able to hold the animal safe and uh, have it there when you come back. And you don't want him, you know, hurt his foot or anything like that unnecessarily. So with muskrat traps too, I've done a lot of research on this and it, the, a lot of the traps have this adjustment screw at the base of the trap here. And then guys use that to set their pan tension. Like you can see on this, this one I haven't adjusted yet, but you see how it holds the pan and it's stiff. Well, if you get a little bit of corrosion in there and it gets too stiff, the animal will step on it and it won't go off. So what I've read is that you can actually set the pan tension by bending the dog of the trap. So for animals like coon, you can set the pan tension a little higher. Uh, for canine trapping, it's important because you don't want like a squirrel going across the top of your set and setting it off. You want, you know, three pounds, maybe four pounds pan tension on that, especially for coyote. 
you want it a little heavier. Uh, but for mink and muskrat, you want that pen tension light, maybe a pound and a half, two pounds. So what you can actually do is bend that dog. So if you want to make the pen tension stiffer, you would bend the dog up so it would actually go like this. So what it's doing is it's putting more force on the end of the lever that's, that's touching the pan trigger here. Now, if you want to set the pan tension lighter, you would bend the, the opposite direction. So you bend the dog down away from it. That reduces your friction and makes the dog slide off the trigger easier. So you're actually loosening the tension. So I'm going to try that this year and see if it works. Because I had a lot of issues with those freaking screws rusting up. And then the, the pans get jammed and they get stuck. Especially if it's out. I have like crappy weather like a lot of other guys do. Especially in the Northeast, snow, ice, uh, all sorts of good stuff like that. But you can use this on this. I also have one and a half long springs, single long springs. Uh, I could use those on this. I could actually set those on the corners if I wanted to. And I still have my conibear there and actually set the, the, the long springs on the corner. These are only, I, I hate these traps. I don't like them. Uh, they're difficult to set flat. Uh, the spring has a tendency to want to hold the jaw up. Uh, the good thing about them is that they are heavy for a small trap. This is a number one size trap. Uh, they do have a lot of weight with that big spring on it. So you don't have to add any weight to it if you want to drown the rat or drown the mink. Uh, a lot of guys use these in the water for that purpose. The, the, the extra weight of it, it acts as a good drowner. Now, on the... On the platform here, you can see I actually have, I put the staples in there. So there's one in each corner. You see the ring there? There's another one right here underneath the trap, underneath my hand. If I get out of the way, there it is, you can see it. So I can wire my traps to the, I can wire them right to the, uh, to the platform. Also, with the, if I wanted to use my one and a half with my, with my hag brackets, uh, if I use the stake anchor, I can actually put my hags bracket anchor on the stake and then have the trap on the platform And then when he jumps off into the water, he's he's attached to the stake I can do that or like I said, you can screw it to the platform if you want to do that so As you can see this is a, a 110 I could also put a 120 on here if I wanted to But you can see when uh, once he goes in here, you'll see this set off here. He'll fire fire him right. He's like boom done <laughs> so that's pretty effective uh the only thing i would have to be careful of is areas of where you're trapping around waterfowl especially if you have bait in here uh you want to try and avoid using a kind of bear there's a, a duck could stick his head in there pretty easy too but it's pretty like i said it's pretty simple it's large enough that it that it they can climb up on it and climb around it so it's possible to catch multiple rats off of this in, in one setting. So I could conceivably, if I put one of the, some of those smaller ones, I could have four traps on this plus two conner bears. So I have six traps on this. I could have two conner bears and then say two or four, one and a halves. Uh, so I could catch multiple rats off of this one platform. But like I said, I have a limited time that I can use them. Uh, there's no spring season in my state for muskrat. It, my season runs from the end of November to the middle of January. And by the middle of January, I have nothing but ice, usually. Sometimes I can get thaw down where I get some clear edge, clear water. And then, uh, you know, you can trap a little bit of open water. when you, There's still going to be ice on the water. But usually I'm dealing with ice by that late in the season. So we'll have to give this a try and see if it works. But I thought I'd show you the design of it. You can see there if I flip it up, I have the pool noodle attached to it. Those are pretty cheap. So if the, if the muskrat's going to chew it up or chew it off, it, it's pretty cheap for me to replace it. Uh, I have them screwed in and I have them strapped on there so they can't come off. They're, they're probably going to chew on it. You know, rodents of any sort like that are going to chew on stuff. They're going to chew it up, chew on the board. But should last a couple of seasons and I can always repair it. Like I said, I just made it out of scrap wood. So I had the conover keepers on there with stainless steel screws. You can see I have one on each side. Didn't cover the, the tunnel, so it's it's completely open. 
You see my put my tag on it as well there. So yeah, we'll give her a go and see see what it's like. Yeah, we'll give it a shot and see how it works. I've never tried a float for muskrat before. I've never tried a float for mink before. Now I have seen, especially again from Canada, some really nice, uh, pretty much targeted mink floats where the, the box actually sits up at an angle out of the water. So the entrance to the box is actually underwater. And then it's got a cage on the back of it. So if the mink swims up to it and smells the bait in the, in the back of the box by the cage, he actually has to swim down under the water and come up in the box for the other end. So that prevents any waterfowl or anything messing with it or, uh, you know, any other animals messing around with it. it. It's unlikely that a coon would swim out to this unless I have it in very shallow water where he could just walk out to it. It's unlikely that it'll swim out in deep water. But like I said, it's primarily uh, intended for, for muskrat and hopefully mink. Uh, we might be able to get a mink in it too. But... I said I'd throw it together and give it a try and show you the design of it and why I done what. And uh, we'll give it a try and see what happens. I've been modifying a lot of my, uh, like I said, modifying my water traps, laminating the jaws on them. Uh, I done my one and I done my number ones too. These are one and a half. I did my number ones too. See? So this is the bigger one and a half. It's got a little more weight to it. But is there anything I am intended for catching coon, especially dry land coon, I'm going to do that to the jaws. Because I've had a lot of incidences where coon have, you know, yanking on their feet or chewing their feet or fighting the trap. Uh, ideally, you want to drown a coon. That's just, uh, you know, dispatch them as quick as you can. Uh, I'm in a situation too on dry land. I can, there's only very few situations where I can use big conibear traps on land. Uh, the biggest I could have out is seven by seven. That's like a 160 size trap. And even then I have to use it in a water course. So it's gotta be in a swamp or it's gotta be in a marsh or it's gotta be in an area of a river or creek that can be covered by water. Uh, I can use a, a 110 on dry land. The, there's rules and regulations, so you have to check your state rules and regulations. There's a lot of rules and regulations for it. That's why I like for coon, I like using a DP, but uh, I'm going to use some of these footholds then that I have modified and see if they work better. Uh, I tried to get some, re I have another big order coming, trapping order that I made, which has a coon, which was a coon kit, because a coon is very prevalent in my area too, uh, that I got from Matt Brophy at Effler Fur. Uh, I just haven't received it yet, but I'll probably do a coverage on that as well. But there's a lot of, that kit came with a bunch of dog proofs. Now I have three or four dog proof traps and I really like using those for coon. As you've seen in my, in my uh, trapping video just this last season where I used the uh, dog proof traps to guard my other canine traps and it worked. So, and I've never lost a coon from a dog proof, never. Uh, you can see on my one video, I think it was one of the first videos I had for this season where I had a, a trap on a drag. It was a re just a regular size Victor one and a half. And I had it close to cover and that coon pulled his foot. He got caught in that one and a half and he was able to pull himself out of that trap because he could reach a tree and he uh, he pulled himself out and he was gone none the worse for wear. Uh, all I could see in the trap was a little, little tiny tuft of his leg hair, that was it. So coons are strong, you gotta watch for that. But yeah, we're gonna give this muskrat float a go and how it works i've been trying to get my all my trapping gear together and uh get it ready for next season uh one more thing i will mention here you know if you watch my uh, muskrat videos i always have issues with gloves <laughs> water gloves so you can see here this is a regular set of trapping gloves for canine that I got from, from Matt at Epler Fur. So they're rubber coated. You can, you can hear the noise of it. It's like a rubber dipped canvas. So they're sand proof and they're really grippy so you can work them, you know, the trap and stuff in the rain. But you can see they're only about wrist high. And I got another set that were intended for mild water use that go to my elbow. Uh, same material, nice and grippy. 
Uh, you'd be able to handle traps when they're wet. But when I was out the other day buying tools for work, I was in Harbor Freight and I found these gloves. Now these are intended for handling oils and chemicals and stuff like that. So what it is, it's, it's like a rain jacket top and it's seamed and glued to a pair of industrial rubber gloves. These are the same type of like dipped rubber, they're really grippy so you can use it and not you know worry about uh, traps slipping into your hand or anything like that. Now they're not insulated, but they are big enough that you could wear a pair of insulated gloves underneath them. So you can see this glove goes all the way up to my armpit. So you're working in like super cold water and you're working in deeper water. Uh, these are really handy. Now, of course, trapping, the trapping uh, stores and stuff do sell these that are they're insulated and everything. So if you're working in super cold water all the time, which I do. Uh, but these gloves, they were only like eight bucks for a pair. And they are 100% waterproof. So just so as you know, they are available and they're pretty cheap. Like I said, if you're working in colder water, you can always have a regular pair of, of knit gloves or something, you know, insulated gloves underneath these gloves uh, to try and keep your hands warm, keep your fingers warm. But just so as you know, that's a good, pretty good tip. Usually the ones that I've seen that are insulated, uh, the regular gauntlets, they do have holes in them so you can make a, a strap for them to, so that they can strap them around your neck so they don't fall off. Although the, the cuff on it is elasticated so it grips your clothing. But I said I mentioned that, that I found those uh, for eight bucks. You can have a, a spare pair of those. Usually the ones that I've seen from the, uh, from the trap and supply stores are about 25 to 30 bucks, depending on where you live. So for eight bucks, yeah, you can buy a couple of pairs of those. Even if you get a rip one or get a hole in one or have them in multiple vehicles. I freaking hate that when I leave my gloves and have them left in my truck or something like that and then drive, you know, checking traps after work and I have my car with me. That's always what happens. That, that's always what happens. But I thought that would be, that was pretty handy. Like I said, I got them for Har from Harbor Freight. Uh, but other than that, that's it for now. We're going to put a lick of paint on this. And like I said, I'll probably camouflage it and put vegetation on it so it, it looks like a little floating mat, a little floating island. But we'll give it a go and see what happens. All right, see you on the next one.